Hey you, you're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. But I'm your host, Final Man Jeb, here to tell you about RoboJack Records. Now, RoboJack Records is the record label destination for Jeb's music, Jim Terrell, and the Sane Riot so far. To come, RoboJackRecords.com, where you can plug in. Plug in. to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, how's it going? And thanks for checking out my show, Straight to Video. Thanks to the regular listeners out there who were so cool about me skipping an episode. Long story short, I messed up. I was invited out on a trip to Florida with my buddy Chris, who runs Glue Pro Goalkeeping Gloves, as he's setting up a really awesome US branch out there. And well, I went and got the day wrong. And when we were coming back, so it messed up all my scheduling. I thought I had everything covered. Then we got to the airport and I realized my dates were out. So thank you for the understanding. But on the flip side, we had a great time and we may have something super cool and straight to video related in the works, which we came up with on the trip. So watch this space because if we can pull it off, it will be pretty spectacular. So, what a week, right? Some crazy stuff happening. It was a massive shock to hear about the passing of Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins. In a world where I don't think there's that many true rock stars, he was one of the very few. Such a talent and personality, and really a massive loss to the music world. And of course we've had the whole Chris Rock and Will Smith incident which was pretty nuts and unbelievable to see. I really don't know where the entertainment industry is headed right now, it's all really crazy stuff. But the Straight to Video podcast continues to move forward and today I bring you a chat with bass player and rock and roll journeyman Marco Mendoza who checked into the show to talk all about his UK tour which starts this weekend if you're listening when this episode drops. Many of you will have seen Marco perform at some point in his career. He's held down the bass player role with some of rock's biggest stars such as Blue Murder, Thin Lizzy, Dead Daisies, White Snake, and more recently as part of Journey. Before all that though Marco was a young aspiring musician growing up in Mexico and finding his way which we talk all about in our chat. He was super friendly and warm and it was great to hear the passion in his voice when talking about his journey and also where he's at today so I hope you enjoy it. Before we hear from Marco please show some love for our friends Dead Skull Coffee and their amazing ground and full bean rock and roll coffee. I can't stop drinking the stuff. They're a truly independent company that are making waves on the music underground and supporting some great events this summer. You can find them at deadskullcoffee.co.uk and if you add the promo code STV on checkout, you can bag yourself 15% off your order as a thank you for the support and listening to this show. Okay, I only had a brief time with Marco as he's on a bit of a press attack and getting as much coverage as he can before his tour. And you can find all the dates at marcomendoza.com along with info on new music. But it was a really great talk and hopefully I can check back in with him at a later date as I'd love to learn more about his journey into Hollywood and some of the experiences he had out there. But for now, let's hear all about his very early days as we dive into my straight-to-video chat with Marco Mendoza. Are you there, brother? What's going off, Marco? Are we on time? Right on the button. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Very cool. How are you, brother? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Where are you coming to me from? Yeah, on the West Coast. I'm on the West Coast. I live not too far from LA, from the Valley, where we used to live in Studio City. We live here now in Orange County, a place called Huntington Beach. It's beautiful. (laughs) Well, I'm coming to you from near Derby, the original home of one Tony Franklin. Oh, Tony. He's a good friend. We met way back. 
I'm trying to think of the year, but I remember getting the call from Tony where he came into town. It was really nice talking to him because I'm a big fan of Blue Murder, the first album. Being a fretless guy, you know. Yeah, I mean, how much of Tony's playing had you paid attention to? Because you would eventually replace him in Blue Murder because he wasn't your run-of-the-mill Sunset Strip musician. Not at all. But that album had such a big impact on the industry, generally speaking. And also, like I said, being a fretless guy, I really paid attention to the fretless players. It was like a period of 10 years where... I thought I was going to be exclusive on the fretless, you know. That's when the Jocko thing came up and Miroslav Vitus on acoustic and, yeah, a lot of cats came out. And the bass play and fretless came to the forefront, you know, Bino, obviously, Palladino. And that tone, man, in my opinion, the fretless tone is just unequal. It's great. The thing with fretless is like a cello. You can have the same instrument played by four different guys and it'll sound different. It really captures your personality, your dynamics, how you play it. So it's kind of cool. Well, we just dive straight in. I don't mind that. It's good. No, not at all. Not at all. I dig it, man. I think your story is pretty inspiring. You're certainly one of the players out there who has truly paid his dues in more ways than one. I'd love to share some of that journey with the listeners. So, Thank you, brother. You were born in San Diego, but moved to Tijuana, Mexico. What are some of your earliest memories of growing up there as you were like surrounded by a musical family on both sides? Yeah. Thank you for doing the homework, man. I appreciate it. I didn't live in San Diego. I, we were born, and as soon as I got out of the hospital, back in the day, you used to hold the new moms in the hospital just for observation, whatever. Two days later, we went south of the border. We lived in Tijuana. And to give you an idea, it's like a border between, you know, the UK and Wales, just across the border. San Diego is like half an hour, you get to the border. And so we lived down there, but our whole life existed in the U.S. My father used to work there. Most of our friends came from the U.S., so we used to love coming down to Mexico. So I grew up in what I call a bicultural, bilingual home in that we all spoke Spanglish. And we came up with our own slang, believe it or not. So I grew up there. Shortly after, five years later, my parents separated. I don't have a lot of memories before that, but I do know when my parents separated, my grandma came from Mexico City. And when she came to live with us, she brought her piano. She came to smooth everything out, get everything in order. Grandma, I have all the love for my grandma. She was everything to me. She influenced me. She inspired me. She taught me how to become a better person, generally speaking. Everything you can imagine. That's a book in itself. But the thing that lingered was how to listen to music, first of all. Her thing was classical piano. So we got into all the big composers and all that. Unfortunately, classical music is very technical and very disciplined and very strict. And the scattered kid that I was, I tried it and then, uh, you know, it was like, oh, too much. So shortly after, my brother, I'm the middle child, my brother got a guitar for his birthday, an acoustic guitar. That's when I found the opportunity to kind of grab the guitar and sneak into a little space where nobody could hear me. And so that I was more relaxed and unaware that anybody was listening. I mean, so I felt the freedom to grab my guitar at my own pace and learn the chords. There was a book of chords that came with it, the Mel Bay book of chords. Got to be the best selling guitar chord book of all time before YouTube. <laughs> right? Still, it's insane, man. So I realized, man, it simplified everything for me because I was concerned about who was listening or whatever. And at my own pace, I started learning. And I realized with three, four chords, I could play a lot of songs. So my grandmother, she had three kids. My dad was the oldest, my aunt and my uncle, the two younger siblings. They all played musical instruments. My grandmother insisted on that. My father was a clarinet player. So he was into the big band, Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, all that stuff. And so I grew up listening to that. Unbeknownst to me that it was, you know, you listen to music over and over and it's kind of clicking. You learn, you know. And then my mom was a professional singer. She had a short career, but it was good. She was a singer. Did it seem viable to you, even from a young age, that it could be accepted to be a musician as a career then? No, because my father was really old school. He wanted us to have a career. He was into aerospace engineering and general dynamics down in San Diego. So I was kind of headed in that direction. But when I found the guitar, bro, I just went berserk. And then when I start learning songs, I learned one, two, three, four, five songs. I'm going, this is cool. So that started my interest. And it became not only therapeutic, but it became my best friend. Whenever things got a little tough, I don't want to say I was a problem child, but I had issues. I was very shy, introverted, 
I never connected. I didn't belong. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Perfect to get into rock and roll. <laughs> I had buck teeth. I had freckles. That kid that's out of place, you know, that was me. So all of a sudden with the guitar, I found my spot and all my buddies would come to me and hang and I'd go to the sports events to, and play guitar. I'd be on the sidelines. They started requesting songs and I learned them. It was also, you know, my way of connecting with my buddies, with my colleagues, you know. You'd had the classical from your grandma. Who was you gravitating to, though? Classical was a lot. It was being played at any given moment. She had like 10 to 20 students that would come through the house. So you would hear a lot of this stuff. And then my dad would play and my mom would play the Broadway shows and all that. But one Christmas, this is how cool my dad was, he got us Abbey Road. And one thing you got to know, in Mexico, even more so back then, we were like 10 years behind. So we got the album, I would say, six, seven, eight years after it came out. I think Abbey Road was 69. So mid-70s, we get it. And my brother was a drummer by then. He started goofing around. Guitar wasn't his thing. And so, you know, we started learning the parts. Subconsciously, we're having a blast playing air bass, air guitar, air drums, and all that. So that was my thing. And to this day, it's still, I hear that album. It just brings a lot of great memories. And they're my heroes, man. That's when I got the spark. And then my brother and I started a garage band. My dad made sure we had a few amps around instruments and he built a little studio next to the house. At 15 years old, I remember, to answer your question from earlier, that's when I knew this is going to be what I want to do. But I had to keep it to myself because my dad was go to school, get a career, la, la, la. Then he noticed at some point how lit up I would get. And he just went along with it against his own advice. He just supported it. Had you had any chance to see any like live concerts during your time growing up in Mexico? Did you have to come over to the States or was there any other opportunities? If anybody's familiar with Tijuana, Tijuana was, I would say at any given moment, there was like 10, 12, 15 clubs on Revolucion Avenue. It's a boulevard. And the folks from high school would go down south of the border because they could drink. You know, you didn't have to show ID or whatever, which is illegal. But that happened a lot. So there was a lot of clubs, a lot of music going on from Brazilian to Cuban jazz, bebop stuff, rock and roll. And I started showing up at these clubs. And I remember getting kicked out because I was 14, 15, 16 years old. So that was the beginning. But my first real concert, my official concert was San Diego Sports Arena, which is now legendary. And it was Alice Cooper. Uh, was you terrified? I was. The theatrical stuff, the whole thing was like, wow. Back in those days, bro, I was really, I hate to admit, but we were smoking a lot of weed. <laughs> To be honest, I think everybody. everybody who I've asked who grew up in the 70s, what was your first gig? Oh, it was Kiss. What do you remember? The smell in the air. <laughs> and for anybody that's familiar with the San Diego Sports Arena, you go up the stairs and you go down. I will never forget this picture. The layer of smoke, of weed. It was so thick. So whether you smoked or not, you go in there, it's contact buzz, right? So now you can imagine my first concert, full on arena, packed to the hill, sold out. People having a great time. And then the theatrics of the whole thing, the show and Alice, how? So uh, very impressive. And then shortly after we did Santana, we went back. And that's when I, I saw Neil Sean for the first time. And he was very young. And I'm like, wow. I guess he had the hair back then. He had the fro. And he was starting to go T, But he looked really extremely young. But man, could he play, man? I was like. Whoa, because if you go back, we all knew Santana. We know the players. We knew the players. And of course, Santana was in the forefront, the whole thing. And then you hear the shredding and we never really knew. There wasn't a lot of focus on him back then. But man, undeniably, man, it was like, wow. I had a conversation with him about that. It's mind blowing, you know how life is as if someone could have tapped you on the shoulder and say hey you're going to be up on stage with him at some point or recording albums with him i don't like to drop names but same thing happened with nugent with ted same thing happened with coverdale of course i mean i've got a lot of stories my career is just full of diamonds man that's a good song my life is full of diamonds you know there you go there's a lyric I believe your move to bass would become when another local band liked your voice but needed a bass player too. So you basically bluffed it and said, I can do that. I'll get this gig. What were your initial feelings about the bass? Did you take to it well or was it a challenge? 
you know, back in the day, you're so young, you're enjoying the, you know, just being involved in music. If they would have told me, play drums, you get on the drums and you try to do your best, you know. But this other band, my brother and I started a band with two other brothers and we were at the beginning stages. So we were starting to do local parties. And this other band had like a year and a half, two years ahead of us. They had transportation with their logo. Just so all the gear can get stolen. (laughs) I know it's never happened to us. And I feel bad for people when that happens. Oh my, no, actually it did happen with the Dead Daisies in Spain. But long story short, they were one of the bands that you aspire to be like, right? They're in the same neighborhood, but they're ahead. They're doing now the big school dances, you know, and the material that they were playing is very cool. They were doing a lot of Grand Funk and Almond Brothers and Bread, Savoy Brown, Alice Cooper, you know. And so when they approached me, they really needed another vocalist. And I was playing guitar, rhythm guitar, a little bit of lead, not much. And they said, you know, our bass player left and we have some dates that were committed to what you want to audition. So I said, yeah. So they gave me, I think, four or five songs, if I remember. I, my memory is pretty bad. So I told my dad and my dad said, get in the car. Went to the nearest pawn shop, got a bass for $8, whatever. Nondescript, no brand, nothing. It was just, a, it was the worst bass on the planet. Six inch action. <laughs> action. Yeah, the action is like, oh my God. And I knew very little about instruments and adjustments and all that setups. So I learned the songs. They had me sing lead and play bass. And that was it. I I got the gig. All of a sudden, yeah, I got on the radar in a better way. And like anything else in life, you start floating to the top, the cream floats, and then you start being considered. People are looking, recruiters from other projects are looking at you. And that's how it's been still to this day. The calls that I get, my mind is blown. I have to settle down and the fan in me goes, yay, yay. But, you know, try to be a pro. And I get calls where there's a lot of work involved, but I love that process. And so you're relearning and reteaching yourself, constantly evolving, you know, and challenging yourself. So I dig that part of it. Right now we're getting ready for the tour and we're figuring out what the set list is. We always have like three or four songs on the set that we change, that we, you know, interchange in there. You're a power trio, right? Yes, I've got some of the best players around, man. That's the other thing. Once you get to a certain level, you have whatever you want to call profile status, whatever you want to call it. We label everything these days. You start attracting the cream, man. I can't say enough about these cats. Kyle Hughes on the drums. He's young. He's got fire. He's got talent. He can sing. And he's teachable and learning constantly. He came to LA, takes lessons wherever he can go, which is very cool. On the drums and then on guitar, Tommy Gentry, who's working with Gunn. And he's also a brilliant man. He's a musician. There's a difference between players and musicians in my book. And he sings, he writes, he plays, the whole thing. And then they're young. They got that energy, man. Give you that fire. As somebody like me, you know, if that's just how it is. It's human nature. You start hanging out with people from my era and the energy stumbles from time to time. I think a lot of time it becomes complacent. So it's sometimes good to have something like a young fire just to kick you up the behind. Yes, absolutely. And also this happens and it's kind of inevitable. I think the bigger the project, the bigger the venues, there's a lot of production sound wise and lights and so you kind of have to adhere to a certain set list you know and change a song here and there so if you're doing 60 80 dates a year you can think by the 30th show 40th show it becomes you have to watch it because you become you're on autopilot i saw your really cool interview where you and billy sheehan sat down and you talked about a similar thing about where it almost becomes predictable so how do you keep that fire going and billy shared the story of touring with david lee roth or opening for van Halen, and they did the yeah. the joint on the stage and he made it look every time that he'd found it at that particular gig yeah yeah you do things on stage that for the most part, they're spontaneous. And then you get the reaction and you know that it's a good piece to keep. To always evolve it and keeping the good stuff, getting rid of the songs that really don't get the reaction that you want to get in bigger venues, especially. That's why smaller venues, in my opinion, it's a great way to test music, the flow of the show and connecting with the fans. And right now, my solo thing is about building it a little bit. The time, it couldn't be worse. But uh, in what way, though? I think people are ready to come out now, finally. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, when you look at my career, I've had a great run and a great journey with the most amazing projects and bands and artists and all that producers. And But if I could change anything, I tell everybody, Rob, if I could change anything, I don't no regrets. I would pay attention to my solo stuff. Start writing songs way back. 
because I was too busy enjoying the run, you know, with the cats. So, But now you've got the experiences to pull on to put it into the solo stuff. Yeah, it's quite a challenge, to say the least. But I'm up for it and I'm doing okay. The last album, View of the Rock, got a lot of good steam behind it, good reviews. And when we play live, people dig it. So, yeah, that's what gives me, you know, the steam. It gives me the gasoline to keep the motor going. So, I, yeah, I enjoy it, man. I also try to be deliberate about if you come and see me two, three shows, you'll hear different sets. I insist on having the audience being part of the party, you know, because I really believe that I've been on the other side so many times and I'm really moved when the artist or the band or the players, they break that barrier and you become part of the show. I love that. I really dig that. You walk away with that buzz. I try to incorporate those are moments. I got, I got chills. Those are the moments that are really special. When you get away from all the business, from all this and that, those are the things that the people that show up, your fans will walk away and start talking about. That was really cool when he did this and we did that. So I try to be conscious about that and deliver something cool. And a lot of it is spontaneous. And again, when it works, then you keep it. It's like a bag of ideas that you put ideas in and then you pull out this one and that one. It's pretty cool. At the end of the day, it's about having fun on stage, making sure your your audience enjoys the time, you know, and have a positive message, especially now, so that people can get away for a few hours and go home and say, wow, that was really cool. The best compliment is when I'm doing my meet and greets and somebody comes to me and says, Marco, I was really in a bad mood, man. I'm going through this struggles, life and the whole thing. You put a smile on my face and I'm going to remember it. Thank you. Whoa. That goosebump moment, man. After playing with so many iconic people over the years, starting from like Blue Murder, Bill Ward, White Snake, Black Star Riders, Right Said Fred, I'm going to throw that one in there, and Journey more recently. You've probably been asked a million times, but who's the person who you'd love to be on stage with or go in the studio with? Is there anybody that jumps to mind? It's all of it. My career's been one of, there's always something cooking. Always something cooking. And I'm always looking forward to that. And once I get there, I realize I'm enjoying that for the moment, however long it lasts. You know, right now we have a couple of things cooking and I'm kind of keeping my mouth shut. So then they want to do the proper press release and all that that I'm excited about. And we'll see what happens after what's going on in the world right now. But it's all good, man. You know, I mean, the highlights obviously are, you know, playing with Thin Lissy, man, with that lineup. It was ridiculous. With Brian and Darren and Scott and John, for me, it was like, wow, to have the opportunity to play those classic songs and come in and and learn from Phil's bass playing, because I try to do that. I try to get into the plane inside and out and then own it. You try to own it. So that was a big, you know, that's a tremendous highlight in my career. Ted Nugent, obviously, Coverdale, Whitesnake, and on and on. And most recently, you know, Journey. Wow. So... It's like that, you know, but I will say the most challenging thing is to stand in front of an audience, however big or small, with your own music, being your own artist and try to relate your own lyrics and your own emotional commitment to the lyrics or the storyline. And when they accept it and they react in a good way, you're not going to please everybody. There's cats that just don't dig what I'm doing. And that's fine. But I try to focus on the positive. So I could go down the list. Somebody, I have a friend in Denmark who, when I come around, he started collecting. He was following my history, right? My discography. If I was involved with a session, he'd connect. And he gave me a list of what I played on and albums and singles and this and that and EPs. And I'm like, wow. I got to say the Dead Daisies is definitely a part of my highlight because we had such a blast, you know? Just all the people you meet, the gigs you do are great, but those friendships which you forge with people over the years, that's priceless, really. It is. And yeah, it's very cool, man. When I get asked that question, I always answer, well, I love them all. They're all my favorites, but I'm leaving room for some more. Yes, that's the best answer possible. <laughs> because it's like that, Rob. I get blown away. You know, tomorrow I might get a call from so-and-so. Hey, we need you. Come on board. And I'm going, wow. And then going through the experience, that becomes your favorite thing. It's just all good, man. Music is ad infinitum, man. Ever changing, never going. A forever unpredictable journey. You never know what's coming up next. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, these past couple of years have kind of hindered that whole thing. But I think we're starting to see the spark and the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm so looking forward to coming to the UK and seeing all my friends there. Yeah, I really love it coming there, man. All righty. Marco, thank you for taking some time with us. I'll let you get on because you're going to spread the word. Yes, sir. I look forward to seeing you in the UK soon. Thank you, brother. Enjoy the rest of your day, sir. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.
Big thank you to Marco Mendoza for sharing his early journey into music and also his excitement about the upcoming UK tour, which you can find all dates at marcomendoza.com. If you want to dive in and catch up on all 170 plus episodes of this podcast, then everything can be found at stvpod.com, along with some cool music, videos and merch. And I really appreciate everyone who listens and supports the show. Plus, a massive thank you to everyone over on the Patreon page for the continued love, as that goes a long, long way to help grow this show and keep things moving forward. If you're enjoying all these chats and want to help support a little more, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash stvpod and see what's happening over there, as it's a lot of fun. All right, that is all for this episode. I hope everyone is doing great. Please keep in touch, and I look forward to when we can chat again real soon. <laughs>